But I remember I started interacting with different energies. As you still are part of the food chain. <laughs> so if you know that you live in a place where there are animals that can eat you, it kind of changes your mindset a little bit. Have you encountered other people with those goblins? Have you ever seen the goblins? All of the stage of the progression where I'm at in this experience and what I'm able to, how the beauty that I see this this universe unfolding before in every moment. For me, it's unbelievable. I agree. I've always thought there's, I'm living life, but also life is living me. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Blue Morpho podcast. And today I'm really excited because I have Barrett Perlman here with us, who is a tremendous friend and uh, su supporter. And I'm a supporter and she's amazing. And so Barrett is a body and energy healer and a psychedelic guide. We're going to go into that a little bit today. But first, I just want to welcome Barrett to the show. Thank you so much for being on. Oh, thank you so much for having me and that lovely introduction. It's been such a blessing to get to know you and to um, experience a lot of these psychedelics with you. And um, yeah, glad to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. And, you know, ultimately, I think we're going to have many more experiences in the psychedelic realms together. It seems like things are lining up for that, which I'm super excited about. We have a, another trip down to Blue Morpho in January coming up where we're going to go deep into ayahuasca. How are you feeling <sighs> about that? I, it can't come soon enough <laughs> is my personal, uh, where I'm sitting with it now. You know, um, I last saw you almost three months ago and, uh, it was cool to sit with that as I came home, but I feel like after about a month and a half, some of that dissipated and I've gotten really into work and deep diving into too much stress lately. And so I'm ready to go back to the Amazon and just de-stress computer off and like, yeah, dive in. What's it like for you going from like super intense psychedelic experiences and then back into the everyday life of computers and the modern hippie podcast and everything that you're doing with your brand and, and everything like that. Walk me mm -hmm. through what a day in the life between like intense psychonaut experiences. And for you guys who don't know Barrett, I just need to put out there. Barrett is one of the hardest core psychonauts I have ever met. Okay. So like, <laughs> like full on embracing the unknown without fears uh, to explore consciousness in the, all the depths that it can be explored. So kudos to you for that. What, what's it like going between one and the other? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I do love those depths very much so. And um, I guess when I left your Blue Morpho retreat, um, I did myself a favor and I stayed in Lima for a few days afterwards. And so I had time to like surf for a day and then decompress for a day. And I think I spent an entire day just like pacing around my hotel room taking notes, like an entire day. Um, I had so much that I needed to like get down and sort through. And um, and then I was having all these reactivation dreams every time I slept. And I had bought some DMT while I was in Lima after, after the retreat. And I my first night that I slept, I remember thinking in my sleep, did I smoke that DMT? Did I wasn't supposed to smoke it. Did I smoke it? Did I like to <laughs> – I was like doubting my own self-control to like not do the the DMT. And um, I was like, no, I'm super sure I didn't smoke it. And I realized I was like full-blown on ayahuasca while I was sleeping. Um, and so going home was uh, – I thought it would be really challenging – but it, it wasn't. Um, it seemed like being tapped into that deep source code that ayahuasca specifically gives you access to. Um, it felt like I, you're still just going through everything as it's meant to be. Like, yeah, sure, I wasn't in the, the jungle anymore, but it's like the buildings are still created out of source code. The airplane I flew on was still created out of source code. And now having to deal with the computers, I actually felt more connected through the interweb um, as if it was all created through source code as well. And it became a bigger tool for me to, um, to navigate. And I was not expecting that at all. Like I go on these um, retreats to Guatemala where I go and I stay in a cabin by myself for two weeks and like there's no internet and I'm usually pretty off the grid. And I remember one time coming home from there and having like a panic attack on the airplane as I looked down and I saw all the warehouses below me and all the buildings. And I was like, I'm going back to a city. I'm not, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. 
Um, but this time was really different. And I think that was because of how much medicine I took with you. And, um, so it was cool coming home and I actually, for the first time ever gave myself some space, some days off as when I got home, um, to integrate into my life and to see my friends and to surf, which is a really big part of my life. So moving forwards with that, it felt like I had all of these things that I needed to create, just like sitting right here in front of me in the fourth dimension and they already existed. And now I just had to put in the physical work in the third dimension to, to make that, have them cross over. And that became really exciting concept to me. And I started watching as ayahuasca started bringing people into my life. Um, my main marketing platform for uh, massage and energy healing actually dissolved their massage therapy section while I was gone in Peru. And so I came back and I was like, how am I supposed to get new clients? And, you know, the mycelium while I was in Peru told me to just trust it. And while I was on ayahuasca said, you know, trust this journey and we'll support you. And I was like, okay, mushrooms, this is a really weird conversation, but cool. <laughs> I'll surrender. <laughs> And so I came home and surrendered and um, I had people start calling me who saw me on the old marketing site, weren't able to contact me through the site and instead bothered to Google me, find my website and track me down and book me. And then, um, yeah, lots of interesting things started coming up and my sort of massage and energy healing business kind of took a back burner to creating content to put out there, to working more in the mindfulness space and the psychedelic space. Um, I had more clients emerge who desired support around microdosing or support around um, taking their first heroic doses. And it's been really powerful to see that that shift of um, feeling in flow with like, I have several things that I offer to people and ways to up-level their mind, body, and their soul. And watching it all just like shift fluidly from one space to the other now um, has been pretty cool. So Right now I'm in a really busy phase and that kind of looks like a, a photo shoot in the morning, a podcast interview in the afternoon, um, then a, you know, a massage client in the afternoon and uh, another one in the evening and maybe um, taking psychedelics later in the evening. And uh, you never know if it's, um, you do mushroom massages as well. So those are really powerful sessions with people. And so, yeah, it's cool. Did I answer That's that? That's amazing. Walk, walk me through a, a mushroom massage. What What is a mushroom massage for those who are not familiar with this term and, and kind of what typically happens? Oh, man, they are the best. If you have the opportunity to receive them from a healer, do it. Um, a, it's just a, a term for um, when my client will take uh, mushrooms and then I'll also take mushrooms. And then we do a two-hour massage and energy healing session. And in that, um, I tap into my deepest shamanic parts of me and tap in deeper to their energy systems and where their blockages are. And it's less of, oh, my shoulder hurts. And can you like work on the rotator cuff? And it's more of addressing the entire flow of the body. Um, sometimes, you know, sounds channel through me, songs will channel through me, um, with like wind, what do you call that? Breath will channel through me um, and different pressure points. And it's really delightfully intuitive. And the client will also receive lots of visions of things and what's going on with their energy. And um, they may relive experiences that cause the trauma that we're addressing that's stuck in their body to be released. And um, yeah, it's a really powerful, powerful way to have a massive shift in your mind, body, and your soul. For you, what do you think like the most intense or most powerful experience giving one of these kinds of massages has been? Oof. Um, I, okay, for me, the most intense experience was going to war for someone's soul. Um, it, yeah, they, they had shown up, so a regular client of mine, and um, this particular day after about, we had seven or eight sessions prior, and he told me that day that he was really ready to release the darkness in his soul. And I was like, okay, great, let's do that. And we're, we're going into the space, we're going deeper into the space. And I'm, 
I finally really drop in and look around in my third eye and realize there's this being here with these these beady eyes and the sharp pointed beak and these ears and it's this dark cloud of smoke. And I was like, oh shit, there's, oh, this is the darkness of his soul. And oh shit, uh, I'm, oh, I'm going to do something about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> like at that point I hadn't had any shamanic battles yet. I was more so seeing people's energy systems and being more of like a, a healer and a flow. And, and that was my first time really dropping in as a shaman and going, okay, well, I, I don't get to lose this battle. So what do I do to win it? And that was wild. I mean, he even cowered. He, he said he felt it. It felt like we showed up on a football field and I threw him down and stepped in front of him and grew into a grizzly bear and started roaring at this thing. And um, I think I ended up I ended up channeling you to help. <laughs> and you threw some rainbows at it and it finally backed off. And um, But then I spent the rest of this, this client's um, session dancing with it. And we probably went to, to war five or six times. And sometimes there were sound frequencies that would channel through me that would kind of cut it and wield it. Like, you know, I wield it like a knife and it would cut through it and then it would break. And finally there was a moment, you know, when it all broke and we, we elevated out of these dark clouds and landed on a, a beautiful planet amongst the cosmos. And, and then I got to do even deeper work with him to, um, to pacify that being's, you know, leaving and to up-level his soul and to, to bring higher frequencies to his soul. And it turned into something really beautiful. Like after an experience like that, how does that leave you feeling? What kind of happened after? Uh, I was stoked. <laughs> um, I was, uh, you know, I was trying to assimilate all my feelings about it. And there was definitely like fear there was um, terror, there was excitement, there was s stoke uh, to keep, you know, I have an action sports background, so I get really stoked on things. Um, I was excited. I was proud. I was um, interested in doing more and uh, desired to, to grow my experience in that realm because it, I feel like I have kind of like this warrior ethos a bit. And even while I was in Peru and I went to Machu Picchu, um, my medicine man, Puma, he pointed out the temple where all of the Amazonian warrior women got initiated. And I was like, I have to be initiated. That's such a part of my soul. And so we ran over there and um, my spirit guide had this initiation with me that I felt like was really powerful leading up to that moment of um, – really locking in with me that there is a warrior spirit inside of me and there is no giving up when times get tough. And it was nice to be in a situation that forced me to confront what do I do in the face of fear? What do I do in the face of fear in an energetic realm that I don't, I didn't at the time fully understand what was, what to do. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, did you feel in that moment like like you were guided to know what to do? How did you know like how to engage that situation when all of that kicked off and got started? Hmm. Um, I think some of my training with you really helped me in that space. Um, I am an avid listener to many of your interviews on other podcasts and kind of grabbing and assimilating that information, especially how you talked about you know, your cosmic shaman battles and what you would do to, to battle these other shamans. Now in this sense, like this wasn't an entity coming at me. So I kind of felt like I got like the, the training wheels version of a shamanic battle, but it still had to, to send things at it and figure out how to channel my energy. So I was drawing on ideas that I had of uh, frequencies and sounds, but I also surrendered to my own higher consciousness and in surrendering, things would start coming out of me, like sounds would start coming out of me. And I, I mean, even I was sort of like, I have no idea what this sound is. And I was like, don't try to control it. It's doing something good, like just surrender to it. And so it was cool to see that like my soul knew what to do, even if I didn't. And as I discovered that my soul knew what to do, I just wanted to surrender deeper to it and allow for that to come through because it was having incredible impact. 
Oh, that's amazing. I think that that warrior spirit that you talk about is fascinating. How did the warrior spirit and your soul kind of represent and come together? Mm, great question. Um, I think growing up as a kid, like I'm an only child and my dad always, I don't know, maybe secretly he wished he had a boy, but that was really fun for me growing up because I got to play all the ball sports and he coached my basketball team and I literally tried every single sport until I gave up on sports and then I got into wakeboarding and snowboarding and I became a professional wakeboarder. And so I think that athlete mentality, that professional athlete mentality of you fall down, you get right back up again. And starting to have that ingrained in me where, I mean, I took some of the hardest falls people would ever see in wakeboarding that someone would get right back up from and like go again. And that kind of became something I was known for, was crashing really hard <laughs> and then getting up and going for it again. Um, so I think, yeah, being an athlete really helped ingrain that. And because of that mindset that it lingers, um, not lingers, but it flows into everything that I do still. And yeah, I just, I desire to put my best foot forward and I have done a lot of work to face my fears. And in doing the work to face your fears, you know, you start to face little ones. Like I used to be really afraid of escalators. And that sounds really dumb and stupid. There's this whole long backstory about having seen a news broadcast about how dangerous they were and then literally seeing someone stuck in an escalator like a week later. And throughout my life, I seem to see people stuck in escalators who've fallen down. And they have like mm. no emergency shut off, just so you know. Like they, they, someone has to hit a button to stop it. And people get fucked up on these things. And <laughs> so uh, like overcoming my fear of escalators, you know, is like a little hurdle. And um, eventually – I'm really scared of sharks. I've been really afraid of sharks my whole life, thanks to Jaws and growing up in the shark attack capital of the world. And um, a few years ago, I decided that I wanted to surf and I wanted to not be so scared of sharks. And so I looked at what kind of experiences you could have with them. And I found that you could swim with sharks without a cage. And I was like, oh. I, they seem to think that you won't die doing this. So like, I'll go do it. And um <laughs> Yeah, I started swimming with sharks without a cage and that became this magically transformational part of my my healing journey in facing my fears and that when you when you literally get like feet away from the thing that scares you the most in the entire world and you can look at directly in the eyeballs and have this dialogue of like, "Oh, you're not going to eat me and I'm I'm not going to kill you either." Like it's really powerful. And then now that you've faced the scariest thing in the entire world, like what else can you do? Like nothing's really that scary anymore. What's it like going and swimming with sharks? Describe that experience for your first time. You have this fear. <sighs> you're, you know, it's a phobia for you. You're deciding to face it. You've signed up for this experience. Where are you? Walk me through that entire experience. What's it like? Yeah. So I was on the North shore of Oahu and my first actual experience was prefaced by an experience a year earlier where I had signed up, we were going out on the boat. And as I'm sitting on the boat, praying to the universe to just please keep me safe in this experience, the boat breaks and we have to get towed back in. So <laughs> I was like, I didn't mean keep me that safe. I meant like in the water, just like, don't let me get eaten. I didn't mean don't, don't put me in the water with sharks. So I just then, yeah, it was another year before I got another opportunity to get back to the North shore of Oahu and um, go out of Haile Eva on, um, I think they're called the Island Shark Tours or something. But uh, so yeah, then I committed, I was out there by myself. And so it was just me and one other woman who opted on the tour that day. Mm. And we go out off the coast and they, they kind of, the sound of the boats brings the sharks. And I'm just super scared because um, I grew up in South Florida and I grew up a lot in the Florida Keys and you know, we would troll for lobsters, which is where they like run a, a rope and handle behind the boat and you put a snorkel on and you, you hang on to it and get pulled behind the boat like shark bait. Um, but you're looking for lobsters and sometimes you see sharks. And so I kind of always saw them as a kid, but um, yeah, they have Galapagos sharks out there. I knew tiger sharks were a possibility. We didn't mm -hmm. see any tiger sharks, um, but they were like, you know, Galapagos, they tell you all about the sharks on the dive and um, on the way out there. And 
you know, my heart's just kind of racing and I'm like, it's okay though. It's like this person has literally told you they're going to protect you. And so I guess we just trust that, right? And then you, the boat stops and there's a shark that comes up and starts kind of like circling the boat. And they're like, all right, we're going to jump in. And I was like, now? It's doing the Jaws thing. Like, we're going to jump in now? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and they, they were like, yeah. And I was like, can someone else go first? <laughs> like, it's, you know, it's just like right there where we are, just like fin out of the water, Jaws. And um, so we, we jump in and... Uh, the rules there are that um, you don't dive below the water to the sharks because that'll actually scare them off. And so we get in the water and we're swimming and there's this one Galapagos shark and it's probably like five feet long. And, she, you know, they, they had told us it would come kind of close and um, just don't touch it. Don't put your hands in front of your face. So I literally, um, I swam the entire time with like, I was holding my hands directly directly behind my back the entire time so that I wouldn't do anything with my hands that was stupid. <laughs> and the shark would come by and it would come, I mean, they are curious little sharks. They would come within like two feet of you. And oh, wow. it, it was just this. And so then another one came up as well. And so now you're in the water trying to not take your eye off of two sharks. And sometimes one's behind you and that's really terrifying. And then a third shark came. So we only got three sharks that day. And that felt like a lot to watch. But as they would come by and cruise, you know, of a foot or two from your face, you're just looking, I would look them directly in the eyeballs and it got so peaceful and mm -hmm. so calm. Like there was something about mentally overriding that fear, um, which is something for me, I call system override. And knowing that fear triggers bad, worse things in the moment. And now to trigger good things, we have to tap into peace and calm and resolve. And I say we, that's like me and all the inner people inside my head. <laughs> but uh, yeah, then to tap into that and to have those, that just peace with them was so beautiful. And it started to occur to me how misunderstood sharks were and what beautiful creatures they were and that they're not just vicious like I was led to believe like with Jaws. And they really are just, they're almost like little dogs. Like at least especially Galapagos sharks, like they're very curious, they're very friendly um, and they would come right up to you. And, it, and uh, at the end of the tour, they said, okay, if you want to swim under the water, now's the chance. And so I got a chance to swim down with them. And that, I love being underwater. Water is my happy place. And to get deep under that water where you're just completely in a different element and um, holding your breath. So you're doing a little bit of breath work and having this moment with this majestic creature, it became absolutely profound. And I retired from being a professional wakeboarder um, in 2011. And this experience took place in 2016. And I realized I had always been searching for something else to kind of give me my kicks, as I call it, my adrenaline boosts. And I tried skydiving and I wasn't impressed. And um, as I got out of the water from this shark dive, then my adrenaline started pumping all through my body. And I'm just elated all of this euphoria. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is that thing I've been searching for. And I thought I would start shark diving a lot more after that. I seem to get around to it like once a year. But Amazing. Um, do you always go back to the same place or do you go to other places? No. So far, I haven't been to the same place twice. Oh. Um, after, after that, I went to the Bahamas. Um, shout out to freediver Steph. She uh, was my college roommate and now she's this Instagram freediver and um, actually world record setting spearfisher. And she took me out on her boat and we did um, a shark dive. And the first time I jumped in the water with her, there were upwards of 30 sharks in the water. Oh, wow. And I actually had a panic attack and freaked out. <laughs> What's that like? Walk me through, <laughs> walk me through this majestic, calm, amazing previous experience and now 30, 30 in the water. Then the panic attack comes and then walk me through the panic attack and how you get to that happy, peaceful place again. Like I think for the listeners, that's going to be important because it's the trigger and the resolution. So walk me through that. It's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, 
you know, she again had said, I'll protect you in the water. And we were dealing that day with nurse sharks and reef sharks and in the Bahamas. And, um, you know, she had said, I'll pay you a million bucks if you can manage to get bit by a shark today. And I was like, you don't even have a million bucks. I don't know how you're going to do that. (laughs) But uh, a, a little girl ended up going with us who came with one of her friends. And so when we get in the water, Steph ends up swimming off with this this eight-year-old girl and kind of leaving me behind. And as I jump in the water, I look around and there's more sharks than I can keep my eye on. And I am so scared. And I'm like sitting on the edge of where everybody is just, on the, you know, sitting on like the, they're all circling around this bait that we dropped in the water. And it's like a crate that's hanging from the boat. And so they're kind of making this diameter all around it. Um, they're this circumference all around it. And so I'm like on the outskirts of that, just, just watching. And they're trying to be like, Hey Barrett, go like, go swim amongst the sharks. And like, they're like, go, go grab sand from the bottom. It's like 30 feet down. I just gotten free diving certified and I'm like trying to hold my breath and I can't go more than like 10 feet because I'm, I'm literally having a panic attack. Hmm. And at one moment I'm so frustrated with myself and with the situation of my expectations not being met. I start crying so now I'm in the water crying in my goggles and trying not to let them know that I'm having this full-blown meltdown. And so I kind of go even farther on the outskirts and I'm swimming around and I'm starting to have a conversation with myself about what's really going on here. And I was like, I had these expectations and they're not being met. And I'm like, okay, well, you should know better than to have expectations, right? That's the easiest way to get disappointed or to um, start to suffer through an experience. So what can I do to change my experience? And I was like, okay, you know how to systems override. And I was like, oh, this is a really big override. <laughs> I was like, we're talking about <laughs> the whole system. <laughs> yeah, there's, this is, I overrode when there were three sharks. Now there's that times 10. Um, and I was right about to give up. And another guy jumped in the water who I had gotten to be really good friends with on the boat. And he had a camera and a video video camera and stuff. And he jumps in the water and he looks at me and he's like, okay, let's shoot some videos of you with the sharks. And I was like, oh no, really right now? Like I'm ready to get out. <laughs> and he's like, I was like, okay, I just, I need a minute. And so I was able to kind of re, and he and I started talking then in the water too. And all of a sudden now I had a, someone in the water watching out for me, which it felt like my my girlfriend really wasn't. She was kind of wrapped up in these two other people. And um, that really gave me a lot of peace. And it, it gave me some space to calm myself down. And um, kind of like, I, I'm not one to succumb to peer pressure, but uh, having him sit there and be like, go swim with the sharks. Like, it's okay. I was like, okay. And I would really worked on channeling my breath. And um, it was a great lesson and really how important the breath is and how we can control it and when we control it, what we can accomplish. Amazing. How long were you in the water with them? Okay. Uh, At the point that he jumped in, I'd probably been in the water maybe like 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I ended up staying in the water with the sharks two and a half hours that day because I started to swim with them then with him. I started to get more comfortable with the sharks. Um, And then I watched, we had a a professional shark diver with us and a professional model who swims with sharks. And so the two of them jumped in the water then and started swimming with the sharks. And they would go and drop down to the bottom. And these sharks would come running up to them and tuck under them and beg to be pet and beg to be played with. And I would watch him like, rub the tops of their heads and kiss each one and then flip them over and rub their bellies. And I'm sitting at the top of the water watching this going, no fuck me way. Like these, (laughs) these sharks don't want to bite me. They just want a belly rub. And so then that really started to boost my confidence of like, oh, maybe I want to touch a shark today. Maybe. And they kind of gave me the advice of like, it's your second shark dive. Maybe not. Um, But so then I started to like, really dive in between them. And it really got my confidence up. And so then I would sit 30 feet down at the bottom and look up and I could just see all these shark bellies above me, which is one of the most majestic sights in the entire world. 
And so that particular shark dive, I mean, you couldn't get me out of the water. They were like, okay, Barrett, it's like time. Like we, we, we got to go. You're the last one in. Like we got to go. <laughs> amazing. And yeah. It really turned into something beautiful. That's amazing to go all the way from, from such an intense emotional reaction to ultimately fully embracing it. I think what really stands out for me is this idea that the fear makes us think something else is going on than what's really going on. Because you say mm. that they ultimately wanted to play and have fun and be part of the experience and actually not be scary or aggressive or negative in any kind of way. Yeah. Did you ever come to a point where you did pet them or play with them, touch them, et cetera, on any other subsequent dives? I, I still have yet to touch a, a shark. Um, it's on my bucket list to redirect a tiger shark. So, oh, wow. Um, so what that means, for those who don't know, redirecting a tiger shark is like um, tiger sharks will kind of come straight up to you and they'll want to do like an investigative bite where they just kind of open their mouth and they might try to poke you with it if they didn't know what you were. And to redirect it, you reach out and you put your hand kind of on their nose and it's almost like a Mr. Miyagi, like, wah, like wax on, wax off kind of thing. Like you, you put your hand on their nose and redirect them away from you. And so that's, and you want to do that? You actually want to go to that level? And tiger sharks, for those who don't know, are considered some of the most aggressive sharks out there. So, and they, yeah. you know, they have resulted in a number of human deaths. So you actually want to now go all the way to the point of tiger sharks and redirecting them. Yes, I think it sounds fantastic. That's like my ultimate shark experience. And I want to swim with great whites in a cage. That's like also bucket list. Definitely All right. When are you going to do the great whites in the cage? When is that on? When's that going to happen? That's kind of on the ten year, ten year plan, because I'll probably have to go to South Africa to do that, and then it's you know all this upcoming year. I'm pretty much just planning to go back to Peru to see you to do ayahuasca. So <laughs> it's not happening next year. <laughs> All right. On that note, are we going to work with the sharks in ayahuasca and here in January? Is that going to be something that we do? Are we going to go into the water worlds and and <sighs> engage with the shark spirits? We really should go into the water worlds. Um, I was right. doing some AI generated art last night and I was getting into some flying orcas. And I was, I, that's another thing on my bucket list is to swim with orcas. Um, those are really cool creatures that are so misunderstood and powerful. Like, man, they're the smartest things in the ocean, I think. Unbelievable. To swim with orcas, is there a place where you can do that? I've never heard of people getting together and swimming with orcas. It sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, so my friend Steph, she went to Norway and did it, um, but I would not suggest that. It's freaking cold. They were in eight millimeter wetsuits and still freezing to death. Um, mm. There is a place in Cabo where I did my third shark dive and um, they have resident orcas down there. And so if they take you out on a shark dive and they get a call over the radio that there's a pot of orcas nearby, they'll take you to swim with orcas instead. And so what I really want to do is go and spend like two or three weeks down there and just book the shark tour every day and be like, I'm here every day until I get orcas. And yeah. Amazing. What's way. it like swimming with orcas for people who have done this? Talk to me about it. I've, I've never heard of swimming with orcas. What what do people talk about? Um, just how majestic it is. They're mm -hmm. these huge, intelligent creatures. I've seen lots of footage of it from their, their orca swims. Um, but yeah, they're they're really majestic. Sometimes they'll come up and play and check you out, but they're, they have no interest in eating you. They're, they know you're not food. And so it really just depends on the pod and what they're up to and what they're doing that day. God, cool. sounds amazing. That sounds yeah, like right? so much fun. That's something. Yeah, now I want to go do that. that you <laughs> made me feel like swimming with orcas sounds like definitely top notch. My brother and I discussed yeah. for years swimming with great whites. So we wanted to do that Ooh. whole thing. And so I was like high on our bucket list as well. But then this idea of swimming with orcas, that sounds fantastic. I'm going to have to look <laughs> that up and, and see how we could potentially get involved with that. That just sounds so good. Yeah. I have a friend well, who lives right by Cabo. So I think that this might be a, oh. a, a yeah, solid reason to have to go visit and also figure out how we can uh, do an orca yeah. swim. That sounds just amazing. I would definitely be down to coordinate that with you and, and see if we could talk to the place about just like you know, can I just give you a flat fee for like two weeks knowing that like <laughs> I'm coming every day and otherwise I'm surfing, but like, yeah, just orcas. Yeah. Or, or figure out who, however they find them. Right. I mean, is it just random or is there some way that they could use, you know, 
some kind of tracking or GPS or satellite imagery or something to figure it out? Do you know? Is it always random? Is it just going out there or is there a way to find them? It's pretty random, but I think all the boats, the local guides who go out on the boats, like if one boat sees it, they radio it to all the other boats. Like they just broadcast it on the system and then everyone can go and find them or I'm sure they have their their people. They they seem to see orcas at least once, if not two or three times a month, based oh, on wow. what I okay. what I see on Instagram. So okay. the odds well, are, like are, a, are high. Yeah, it sounds like really good. I think that sounds like a, an amazing amazing opportunity and plan. I got yeah. You got to swim with orcas. I mean, the opportunity to swim with orcas sounds mind blowing. Yeah. As mind blowing as Aya can be, as mind blowing as these other experiences, that's got to be right up there too. The the beauty the you know, you say majestic quality of it. Fantastic. Absolutely. But um, I so do, you I got over your fear of sharks. Them. Yeah. Well, and so you had mentioned about facing your fears and, and taking yeah. that dive into something that scares you. And um, that actually happened to me on ayahuasca. Uh, that same similar principle of my first DMT breakthrough. Um, up until that point, I had spent like a year trying to break through on DMT and I sat with multiple different people who tried to help me break through on DMT by smoking it, couldn't break through. And I would always get these clowns with sharp teeth that would run to the forefront and they would just send spinning signs in my face. And I was like, what the fuck is this? (laughs) And on our last ayahuasca ceremony together, you gave me this, you were like, I'm going to send you deep into DMT land. And I was like, okay, I hope so. And um, as I'm having this massive purge, there's the clowns with the sharp teeth sitting there and they're just pulling this purge out of me. And I'm like, Oh God, what did I let you do? Hamilton, this sucks. And I'm looking at them and I finally could go to communicate with them. And I realize again, these things that they didn't scare me ever, but I asked them like, are you guys friendly? And they turned and looked up at me for the first time and they smiled this big sharp tooth grin and they were like, "Mm -hmm." and I was like, Oh fuck. Of course they are. Like, what? Are you guys just like the gatekeepers to this breakthrough? And they were like, "Mm -hmm." and now that I had interacted with them and turned something that was seemingly like straight out of a horror movie into these friendly little goblins, like they just completely revolutionized my experience with DMT. Or came on the other side of them. So they say they're friendly. They turn out to not be scary. I mean, this is common in Aya visions is that really scary looking things can ultimately be super friendly. And so you got to investigate them, man. We talk about that. You got to go into the spirit. You got to figure out what they're all about. You got to ask them who, what, where, why, when, uh, you know, they express themselves energetically. And so you have this sort of litmus test, you know, exactly how they're going to express themselves energetically by the interaction that you're having. So they can't really confuse you. And I've always said like, people would say, well, what happens if one lies to you? And I'm like, they lie to you. Like I'm lying to you. Like they, they like <laughs> broadcast, they telegraph what's going on. So you ask these things, you know, that if they're friendly and then what's on the other side of that? Well, they actually, they took me somewhere else. So they took me to a separate room, it was almost like a museum entrance or something. And they sat me down in a chair and then they opened these giant doors and kind of like pushed me through. And then I was in the breakthrough and once I got to the breakthrough, it's like this this peak DMT experience right at the start of the breakthrough where it was like, oh, I started to dissolve into cosmic dust in a beautiful and loving way, surrounded by infinite love, understanding that there is no time, there is no space. It's all just this construct. And there were these beautiful magenta and yellow colored clouds of smoke. Um, they're and almost like dust, like a fog machine kind of essence, like... And these extraterrestrial butterflies kind of thing. They, they have like a little too many legs and a couple extra tentacles, but they still have butterfly wings and they would just sit and just beat and they weren't going anywhere. They were just almost like the beating pulse of essence. And um, there were spinning clocks or like for kind of as, um, as a joke, <laughs> which I found it funny that this, this part of existence had jokes. Um, but it was like, Hey, this thing that you think is time, it's all made up. It's not real. And, um, it was cool because then the deeper I could surrender to that experience, the deeper I would go and almost like I was really dissolving into the unified field. Wow. That's fantastic. 
since the experience, like the unified field, you know, um, just fantastic. After that experience, and then going back to other kinds of psychedelic experiences, what's that transition like? How do you, how do you experience that? Mm. It's definitely not an experience you get on mushrooms. Like mushroom is the psilocybin is the primary psychedelic that I work with. And, um, I have a beautiful relationship with it, but you rarely get to a place. I have not yet been to a place on psilocybin where I'm dissolving like that. I've, I've been to heroic doses where I've turned into like, I've turned into energetic bits of my own essence. Um, but I didn't dissolve in that space and I got to do other things. Um, I find it most similar to Bufo, to 5-MeO-DMT. Um, that's the only other thing I've done where really as it kicks in, there's like this dissolution and surrender kind of moment um, that you can feel the beating source code of everything. And um, yeah, that, that lack of distinction between you and the unified field. Walk us through Bufo, start to finish for everybody, <laughs> you know, in our community that's interested and doesn't know anything about it. So yeah. What is it? How does it work? What do you do? How is it administered? What was your experiences like? Okay. So Bufo is a toad venom from the Sinoan, um, Sinoan desert toad or Colorado river toad. Uh, and it in its synthetic form is 5-MeO-DMT. And it's my understanding they have kind of different um, experiences. I have only done Bufo so far. And I've done it about four times now, uh, four different ceremonial settings. And my first time I did a really big dose because I like to go hard on psychedelics. And um, it was very interesting in that I had this sort of deep sigh escaped me and I felt my entire soul relax, like almost like this lifetime, my lifetime before, my lifetime before that, my lifetime before that, and my lifetime before that all got a chance to just relax and let go and dissolve into that cosmic space dust. And um, on Bufo, I see a lot of uh, yellows, oranges, and greens, kind of. Seems to be a theme with the actual toad venom. Um, it's administered via smoking. So you put it in a contraption, kind of like DMT, light it, and then you have a facilitator. You really wouldn't want to do Bufo by yourself. Um, and the facilitator will kind of guide you through exhaling and then inhaling the medicine. You hold it and it kicks in with a as you're holding the inhale. Um, and then you lay back and you've kind of got this nest space because I'm a big mover and your, your consciousness goes somewhere else and your body stays put and does a lot of things. And, um, yeah, for me, I tend to do a lot of hip opening things. I tend to, uh, get back to some, what my facilitators described as like childlike interactions with my own body, um, to things I do with my, my tongue, with my mouth, um, fingers in my mouth. Um, hands on my face, through my hair. I always kind of come back and my hair is completely knotted and wild. Um, but kind of moving forwards from that first experience into some of the later experiences, I've had some of my biggest lessons on Bufo. Um, my second ceremony was right before I went to Peru. And I was so excited about it because now I really wanted to tell the world about Bufo and I wanted to go into it, remembering everything that happened and be able to like facilitate that message back out. And so I took an even bigger dose and I just had what's called a whiteout, which is, it's not like a blackout, but it's like you took so much medicine that you're in it and you come back and you don't remember anything. Oh. And yeah. And so I, as I was coming out of it, I was immediately on myself disappointed at my experience and um, it became this really big lesson about surrendering and to always go into a plant medicine ceremony or natural medicine in this case and with these pure purpose to be there for you and to surrender into that experience. Um, and that surrender really sparked a whole surrender in my whole life of surrendering in Peru and then surrendering on ayahuasca and now just surrendering into my entire existence and everything gets easier. So that really challenging or almost non-existent like um, ceremony became one of the most profound lessons for me. 
And then moving forwards, um, this last ceremony was like a, just over a week ago for me. And I ended up doing four rounds of Bufo. Up until that point, I'd never done more than two. And we did some smaller smaller doses. Um, so my first time I did 63 milligrams. The second time I did 72 milligrams as my first dose and then smaller ones after that. But this uh, fourth time I started at 36 milligrams and we stayed at 36 milligrams the whole for each dose. And I found that to be um, my favorite space I've played in so far. And the, it kind of, each experience is so different and because I'm a healer and because I'm a, a psychonaut um, and because I'm a shaman, I'm becoming a shaman, I guess, uh, the spaces that I desire to go into with the medicine um, can be different than just someone who's showing up looking for a healing space. Um, and I enjoy going into some of those harder lessons. And so this last ceremony was um, really wild for me. Uh, it started out with the beautiful colors and the lotus flower emerging from kind of like my heart center and beating with the pulse of everything and how beautiful is that. And then I took a second dose and it was like, oh my gosh, now I'm tapped into my essence and all of the, the beautiful things and watching how things are written in a way that's not sacred geometry, but like even dialed down more to um, – just like quarks and quantas and watching their creationism and being shown things I couldn't even completely understand that again, go with that theme of surrender, the deeper I could surrender into the not knowing and not trying to figure out the more that it felt like information was just being planted in my brain. And then my third dose uh, for me started to feel at some point like wildly out of control. And, um, I am not a person who struggles with control. I love being out of control. Uh, but there was a moment where it went from from love and, and things growing away from my body to out of control, what's happening, am I dying? Um, and I, you know, I even kind of opened my eyes and looked at my facilitator and he didn't seem to be panicking. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to panic. I'm not dying. I'm alive. And I got a whole slew of different messages. Um, that one turned into like a, a shamanic presence that was there trying to tell me something that was not geometry and colors. And I was like, that's really different. And so I kind of came out of that and he and I were sitting with it. And, um, you know, you, you each, each um, round lasts about 10 to 15 minutes. And then even when you kind of come out of the depth of the heavy visions, you could still be experiencing emotions. So um, on my first round that day, I came out of it and I just started screaming, like these deep cathartic like yells and screams. And it started to tie together this message for me that I wasn't feeling very heard in some of my dating relationships. And it was my body's way of finally starting to clear my throat, throat chakra as as these people dissipated off my radar that like now I get to have my voice and if they don't want to hear it, that's fine. Please leave. And, but here's my voice. Here's my, my speaker box again. And I spent a good 10 minutes just like yelling and screaming and then yodeling. I don't yodel, but it felt great. <laughs> and uh, getting that sense of playback. And so yeah, so then to go into the fourth round, having had, three really different experiences in front of it. I was, I was, I would not have asked for a fourth round. My facilitator offered it and I was sort of like, whew, that third round kind of kicked my ass, but um, yeah, okay, let's do it. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Yeah. So that fourth round um, was completely different from the first three. Um, you know, there was an interesting point where I was like, oh no, have I had too much medicine? Um, it also, again, got wildly out of control for me where it went from the beautiful images to now just like a flood of, um, it almost felt like I was vomiting on my face. Like I'm laying down on the ground and it felt like I was vomiting on my face or it was all going over my eyes, um, like it was going in my eyes. And I felt like my eyes had swollen shut, my face blimped up, uh, at least energetically. I was feeling like my face was twice the size of it and my eye was huge golf ball. And, um, I s tried to, to suppress the desire to panic. Um, and 
then everything turned black with all these little dots of yellow, orange, and green. And I was like, shit, am I dying? Um, is this death? And it wasn't, wasn't the usual death I experience on mm -hmm. ayahuasca or other medicines where it's like, oh, you get wrapped in love and you dissolve and it's beautiful. And this was like, there was no love. There was mm -hmm. like fear almost. Um, and so I, I took a breath because I was like, if I can breathe, I'm not dead. Took a breath. I was like, okay, I'm not dead. That's cool. Um, and really struggled with it, struggled with the sensations and the things. Um, and so came out of it. And, you know, as soon as I could make words, the first thing I said to my facilitator was like, is my face swollen? And he was like, I don't, I think I was like, no, it would be like blimped up, like huge. And he's like, no, 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 it's not huge. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, wow. Like I really thought we had fucked me up on Bufo and, um, sat with it, came down from it and yeah, it became for me a really interesting lesson as a facilitator um, about other kinds of experiences that people can have in the medicines. You know, like mm. when I started doing Bufo, I was like, oh, it's so beautiful. I'll just like skip mushrooms, go straight to Bufo. Like nothing bad happens in that space. It's just love and opens you up to love. And now I'm getting to see the deeper, darker side of it. And um, that was I mean, it was, it was intense. It was a lot of work that day. Uh, and I'm, I guess I'm me and I've done enough work that I walk away from that experience going, holy crap, that was cool. Um, and I love to do it again. Um, but still sitting in the lessons from that one, that one really took a lot of integration for me. Um, and then I would get, you get bufo reactivations in your dreams. And, uh, I had some gnarly dreams my first couple nights. Um, one night, it just kicked back in and I just died over and over and over and over and over and over again all night. And that was like really rough and really kind of messed up my whole day the next day. Hmm. Um, and, and tackling that and sitting with the lessons from that, sort of why did that happen? Um, and I think that's where integration is such an important part of being with the plant medicines and – what did they show you and what, you know, I think everything happens for a reason. And even if it's not the experience that you wanted to have, it's the experience you needed to have. And so if you needed that experience, what does that mean? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. What's integration for you? What, what is that experience like? How do you do it? You know, what's the core to that practice? Of, of integration? Yeah. Um, I think it, the easiest way to begin integration is journaling, um, really starting to write down your thoughts and then realizing that there's connections and there's through ways and getting very self-reflective of it um, and trying to figure out how you can take what you learned and implement it in your life so that it's not just you watched this beautiful movie go by, but in watching that beautiful movie, what did you learn from the main characters or from the location or the, the scenes that played out, what are the lessons there? You know, the same way that you might read a children's book and be like, oh, that was a cool story, but usually there's a moral behind it. There's some sort of um, takeaway and like be a good person or treat people with respect or treat yourself with respect. Um, so yeah, so integrating those things for me is a lot of journaling. Um, it's a lot of getting getting places where I'm not going to be disturbed and can be in nature. So in the ocean, um, sitting at the beach, maybe sitting in a park or walking through a forest and taking that space away to like decompress and give yourself space to feel emotions that might be coming up from it. Um, I personally have a terrible tendency to kind of jump straight into a full blown day the next day. And you may just feel like you need to cry and, allowing yourself that space to cry, to let those things move through you so that they don't get stuck in your body as well. Because that's what the medicine's doing is it's trying to help you unstick yourself and giving those things that space. Um, it can be things like yoga, often movements are really helpful practice. And um, if you have anyone you can talk to about it, um, community is really helpful. I find getting other perspectives on it can help shed light on things that you didn't necessarily see yourself. And yeah, that's uh, interesting. 
for all the young psychonauts out there, right? Mm -hmm. The people first thinking, oh, this sounds interesting. I want to have these experiences. What's your best advice for them? Don't start with heroic doses. It's not a, it's not a beginner. It's not a beginner's playground. Um, (laughs) definitely, you know, pick your, pick your plant medicine and get to know it a bit through, uh, smaller and reasonable doses. Maybe consult with someone about what those are. Um, if you're looking at mushrooms, for instance, you know, make sure you're taking an eighth before you decide to take like five grams or more. Um, and feel confident in that space and, um, also go into it setting clear intentions. So don't be afraid to sit with the medicine, to program it before you take it with your intention, you know, simply by placing your hands over it or with ayahuasca, you as my shaman would help me program my dosage and um, asking it to deliver the experience that you like. And so maybe that's a healing journey. Maybe it's as simple as letting go of what you need to let go of, being shown the messages that you need to see, understanding the knowledge that you need to know. Um, and giving yourself a really safe set um, and setting. So programming it with your intent is your set, your mindset, and also being really responsible for your setting. So where you're going to be, that you're somewhere safe, that no one's going to be coming to disturb you, that you're very unlikely to have an emergency. Um, I like to you know, use my home. I like candles only, no real light. I think it brings a nice um, natural element to the space. And um, there's like a playlist I like to listen to or uh, an East Forest uh, has an album about music for mushrooms. That's a really delightful journey of just mellow music and and animal sounds and things that support you in that space. And um, yeah, just when you're in it, trusting that, um, that you took something and surrendering into the experience is really the best best advice in that space. If something comes up that makes you uncomfortable, you need to go into it. It's the only way to move forwards, really. If you try to avoid it, it's going to become harder and more challenging. So go through it. Yeah, I love those. uh, I love all of those pieces of advice, especially the one about learning a plant medicine and getting involved with it and not just dabbling around and actually having more experience with one. And um, also, responsible dosing as you learn how sensitive you are and Mm. you know what it's like for you to be in that experience i always try to tell people that it's very unique to you and so you're there for your own experience you've heard stories of others but you know be kind to yourself be loving to yourself be gentle with yourself early on in the experience with the dose so that you can become comfortable with it and then you can grow from there Anyway, on that note, I want to thank you so much, Barry, for being here with us on the Blue Morpho podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here as a guest. We'd love to have you back on the podcast uh, and continue the discussions. I look forward to seeing you in January. Where can people find you? How can they get in touch with you? How can they experience your services? Share with the world everything about you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I also can't wait to see you in Peru in less than three weeks. Um, Yeah, you guys can keep up with me. My biggest platform I'm active on is Instagram, so at Barrett Perlman. Um, Also, my podcast is the Modern Hippie Podcast, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Um, You can also find us on the Modern Hippie Pod on Instagram. And if you desire to contact me about services or anything, my website is barrettperlman.com. And um, yeah, be happy to connect with any of you on psychedelic integration support, on uh, month containers for microdosing or even longer integrations, um, as well as I have three-month container for transformational psychedelic experiences um, where I can actually work with you to take mushrooms on a more regular basis and integrate those practices and lessons, um, even up through taking heroic doses and helping support you around that. And um, if you're your local, get you in for a massage or some energy work. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Barrett. Really appreciate your time today. And I look forward to the next time we get to talk. Have a beautiful day. Mm. Same. Thank you. <laughs>